All right. It is an honor to give a talk in this virtual workshop on rich and scalar curvature in honor of Professor Michel Guarma. Um, today, the topic I want to uh, discuss is a certain geometric comparison theorem for scalar curvature, and more precisely for scalar curvature lower bound. Perhaps, perhaps before I start a real talk, let me also organize all of the. Uh, uh, sorry, let me also thank all the organizers for this uh, workshop and uh, um, all their effort they put in to make it uh, available to everyone. All right, so let me start by talking about the motivation of this research. And the first the motivation really comes from defining weak notions of scalar curvature lower bounds. So maybe it's a good time, it's a good idea to discuss what is known in, the, uh, in, in, in this re uh, direction perhaps uh, weak notions for other lower bound, uh, for lower bounds of other curvatures. Okay, so let's, uh, the story begins with a sectional curvature lower bound. The way to um, a geometrically characterize that a Riemannian manifold and sectional curvature bounded from below is through a triangle comparison theorem. Okay, so precisely the theorem um, is proved by Alexandrov in 1951. Uh, and it says the following thing. So suppose you take a Riemannian manifold and uh, then the following condition is equivalent to say that the sectional curvature of the metric G is bounded from below by K, okay? So what you do is that you take an arbitrary three, uh, an arbitrary geodesic triangle with vertices X, Y, Z on M. And um, since it's a geodesic triangle, the side lens satisfy the triangle inequality. So you can um, isometrically embed this triangle into the space form SK. Okay, SK here is a uh, space form of, uh, of Gauss curvature K uh, of dimension two. Okay, and take the X, y, Z, X0, Y0, Z0 be the vertices of the geodesic triangle there. Okay, and then um, you take this um, X prime and X0 prime on the opposite edge uh, uh, to X and X0. Okay, so X, Y, Z here and x0, y0, z0 here. So you take this correspond corresponding vertex on the opposite edge such that they bisect this edge, uh, this edge yz into the same ratio. Okay. Then the conclusion that the sectional curvature bounded from below by k is equivalent to say that x x prime, the distance is always larger than or equal to the distance between x0 and x0 prime. And moreover, we have a equality case, right? So namely, if your um, uh, this inequality is actually equality for any choice of triangle and any choice of this x prime point, then um, mg has constant sectional curvature. So this is a very nice geometric meaning. Um, um, the picture here is, um, is taken from the very famous book by Cedric Villani, um, Optimal Transport, Old and New where it's very easy to uh, visualize that um, the better, well, the, the, um, that the sectional curvature lower bound is captured by the fatter uh, of the geodesic triangle, right? So the fatter the geodesic triangle is, the more curvature it has. So similar stories has been the center um, topic for geometric analysis um, in the Ricci curvature lower bound, okay? So, um, here, um, the, the story is very entirely different, but uh, let me also mention, let me just mention that the convergence theory for, uh, for rich curvature lower bound has been extended, uh, extensively studied by Chigger coding neighbor, and the, uh, lower, the, the lower bound has a, a metrics with low regularity, namely the weak notion of rich lower bound was pioneered by uh, John Lott and Cedric Villani, and independently by storm. Okay. And uh, they are defined on metric matter spaces. So our question today is, is there a good way to make sense of scalar curvature bounded from below by K for spaces with possibly low regularity? Okay, so our story would be a little bit similar to the uh, story for sectional curvature, namely the Alexandrov comparison theorem. Okay. Then um, 
the um, idea starts uh, started with a paper by Gormov, and he suggested that well, triangles play um, the role of comparison object for sectional curvature uh, because sectional curvature cares about the geometry of this uh, you know, two um, two dimensional sub subspaces of the tangent space. Right? And scalar curvature cares about the uh, uh, scalar curvature is the trace of the sectional curvature all around directions. Therefore, a good comparison object is the Riemannian polyhedron. Okay. So for instance, the very rough idea um, pair of the sectional curvatures compare Alexandro comparison is that scalar curvature um, has a lower bound, let's say a bit bigger than to zero, then the polyhedron inside this manifold will be generally fatter than the Euclidean polyhedron. Okay, so how to make it precise? Well, um, this precise statement for this comparison theorem is really encoded in this so-called dihedral rigidity conjecture. Okay. So let me first start with the case where scalar curvature is bounded from below by zero. Okay, so this is also the case first invest investigated by Gormov. So our object is going to be um, PG0, so G0 is going to be the Euclidean metric, and um, uh, we're looking at um, a uh, convex polyhedron in the Euclidean space. Okay, then um, let's compare this polyhedron uh, with a Riemannian polyhedron. So the conjecture is the following. Um, if you put another smooth Riemannian metric on the polyhedron P, such that uh, three things happen. So the first thing is that the scalar curvature is lower, uh, is non-negative in P. And the second is that the faces of P are weakly mean convex with respect to the outer unit normal. Okay. And the third condition is that the dihedral angle um, with respect to this new metric G is everywhere not larger than the corresponding original dihedral angle of P G zero. Okay, so if these three things happen simultaneously, then this new Romani metric G is actually uh, isometric to a flat Euclidean polyhedron. Okay, so let's see uh, what the theorem says. Well, let's start with uh, dimension two. So in two dimensions, let's uh, uh, recall the three conditions. Um, well, the polyhedron here just means a polygon. So let me draw a triangle over here. Okay, so this is M2G. Okay, so then the theorem says that the following three things cannot happen simultaneously, namely, well, scalar curvature here is twice Gauss curvature. So the Gauss curvature KG is now zero. And second, um, um, the um, mean curvature, boundary mean curvature here is just the boundary geodesic curvature. So the geodesic curvature is um, non-negative on the boundary. Okay, and the third condition is that, well, we're comparing this M2G to a Euclidean triangle. Okay, let's denote the inner angle by alpha J and alpha J zero. So the third condition says that alpha J is uh, less than or equal to alpha J zero for J from one to three. Okay, so if the three things happen simultaneously, then um, we want to show that this M2G is actually um, isometric to a two-dimensional flat um, Euclidean triangle. Well, this is indeed the case because um, by the gauss bonnet formula, if you add the Gauss curvature and uh, the boundary total geodesic curvature and all the exterior angles, you have two pi. But now uh, notice that the, um, we know, so we know that the sum of pi minus alpha j zero, alpha j zero, remember, is the uh, inner angle of the Euclidean, Euclidean polygon. Therefore, they sum up to uh, two pi. And we assume alpha j is less than or equal to alpha j zero, so um, pi minus alpha j is bigger than or equal to pi minus alpha j zero. Okay, so then all the three terms um, are bigger than or equal to zero. Um, um, well, the first two terms are bigger than to zero, the third term is bigger than to two pi, therefore we have equality. Um, then it just um, automatically means that the polygon is flat. 
Okay, so how this is useful as a definition for scalar curvature lower bound, say non-negative? Well, the observation is that the conditions H non-negative and uh, the angle assumption alpha j less than alpha j zero can both be interpreted as a C zero conditions of the metric. Okay, so this is also an observation by Gourmet, um, because of course, if you measure the angle between two vectors, you don't need to uh, take any derivative, right? And also, um, um, what's less non, uh, what's less trivial, and uh, it turned out actually true, is that being weakly mean convex is a stable condition under small c zero perturbation. Okay. Therefore, let's take a specific polytope. Okay, so you take your favorite uh, polygon, let's say cubes. Um, then let's try to define what it means for c zero metric G to have non-negative scalar curvature. Well, we can say RG non-negative is equivalent to say non-existence of cubes with mean convex faces and acute dihedral angles, right? Okay, with this observation in mind, um, assuming this conjecture, the dihedral angle uh, rigidity conjecture, then Gormov proved the following theorem, namely suppose you have a smooth Riemannian metric, a uh, manifold, and the GK is a sequence of C2 metrics on M, on M converging in C0 as tensors to a limiting C2 metric G. So now all the metrics in this uh, theorem um, are C2 smooth, but the convergence only happens at C0. Okay. Then suppose your, um, all the, Riemann, uh, all the uh, scalar curvatures of GK are non-negative, then um, the scalar curvature of G is also non-negative. And the proof is uh, quite simple because um, if your scalar curvature, so uh, if um, maybe let me write a proof sketch. Um, so if our G is uh, strictly less than zero on, uh, on an open set U contained in M, then um, one can construct a cube with uh, say a cube here. with uh, mean, co um, mean convex faces and everywhere the dihedral angle is less than pi over two. Okay. However, we know the convergence happens uh, on, in C0, right? So then uh, this same cube should have um, H positive and uh, dihedral angle less than, strictly less than pi over two on um, GK uh, for K very, very large. Okay. But this violates conjecture, right? Because this, uh, uh, we said, because we know the scalar curvature of GK is non negative. So let me just quickly mention here that the convergence theorem um, about is also proved by Richard Bamler um, using Ricci flow, an entirely different method, and extended by Paula Buckhart Grimm to allow almost a non-negative scalar curvatures. Okay, so um, starting now, I'll be talking about the main results of this talk. So um, I will separate two cases, namely um, the case of scalar curvature um, non-negative and the scalar curvature bound from bounded from below by some negative constant, okay? So uh, let me first describe a family of polygons, um, polyhedrons actually, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're gonna study the dihedral rigidity conjecture on later. So very quickly, let's let P0 be a convex polygon. Okay, so this is a convex polygon in R2. And uh, we will consider the Cartesian product Uh, what is that? Well, it's just a so-called a prism, right? So, uh, for instance, when n equals to three, then this just means that we take this polygon as the uh, base surface, and uh, I'm going to make a prism out of it. Okay. So let's call all such um, polygons um, n-dimensional prisms. And if all the interior angles of P0 are not larger than pi over two, then let's call P a non-obtuse prism. 
Okay, so uh, let me also remind you the notion of a simplex. So a simplex is a very basic um, building block for any um, smooth Riemannian uh, smooth manifolds. So in the picture, um, uh, we I show you a simplex and the prism. Okay, so the first theorem, um, let's call that theorem A here, um, is the following. So basically the rigidity, dihedral rigidity conjecture holds for all three-dimensional simplices and the prisms, and for all n-dimensional non-obtuse prisms where, dim, uh, where n is between four and seven. Okay, so the precise statement is the following. So suppose you have a uh, three-dimensional simplex or prism or n-dimensional non-obtuse prism. Then suppose you have a, another Riemannian polyhedron, which admits a polyhedral diffeomorphism to P. Right? So, so basically, this diffeomorphism here, this means um, it maps um, faces uh, of M to faces of P and also edges to edges and the vertices to vertices. For in higher dimensions, you have more strata, but uh, uh, I assume that this map is different more than respect all the singular strata. Okay. Now suppose that scalar curvature is non-negative in M and the second to the mean curvature is our non uh, non-negative on faces of M, and also the dihedral angles are le less than to the constant dihedral angle of P on along edges of M. And the conclusion is that then MG is isometric to a flat polygon polyhedron in Rn. Okay, so some remarks first. The dimensional re restriction N less than 57 comes from the regularity theory for free boundary minimizing hypersurfaces. Also, um, when n is bigger than three, the assumption on the prism being non-obtuse is made for regularity of um, solutions to elliptic equations. We will see this um, later. Okay. And uh, actually more generally, um, this is kind of important also in the proof and in the application. One can prove such a theorem for Riemannian polyhedron M, which admits a degree one polyhedron map to P. Okay. So polyhedron map once again means that a map that respects the singular strata. Okay, so before um, I, I was talking about the comparison theorem for scalar curvature non-negative, like the lower bound being zero. Now you might ask what happens if the lower bound is non-zero? Okay. So when the lower bound K is negative, I have a, a pretty complete story for that. Then um, um, for the sake of completeness, uh, sorry, for the sim, uh, sake, of, uh, sake of simplicity, let's just, let's just say uh, k, the lower bound k is just a minus n of a minus one. Okay. okay, so then we're gonna construct a certain polyhedron in the hyperbolic space as our modal comparison object. So let me remind you of some basics of uh, hyperbolic geometry. So, the hyperbolic metric, um, well, by that I mean the metric, complete metric on, on Hn with sectional curvature minus one. So this metric has a um, um, has many forms, and I will take this form as dx1 squared plus this exponential of 2x1 times dx2 squares uh, add up to dxn squares. Okay. All right, so um, Maybe I should also say that in this um, that in this coordinate system, all the variables are arbitrary real numbers. So these x one equals to constant planes are called Hollow spheres. Okay, so let me draw a picture in dimension two. So this is x one. This is x two. So if you take a horizontal hypersurface um, x one equals to constant, then um, well, let's take this surface and the induced metric on it. So intrinsically, this metric is Euclidean, right? Because if you look at the GH and if you take X1 as constant, then you're only left with the Euclidean component. Moreover, embedded in as a hypersurface in, um, in the hyperbolic space, these surfaces are totally umbilical, right? With constant mean curvature, 
with respect to this uh, upward pointing unit normal. Okay. Okay, so these are these horizontal um, hyperplanes. How about vertical hyperplanes? Well, these vertical hyperplanes turns out to be, uh, well, they, they turn out to be totally geodesic. Okay, and moreover, um, they meet each other and uh, they, they meet these uh, horror spheres um, orthogonally. So the following theorem I'm gonna present you is based on discussions in the IAS workshop back in uh, October 2018 with many people. Okay, um, this workshop was organized by um, Christina Sormani and Misha Gormal called Emerging Topics on Scalar Curvature and Convergence. Okay, so let's once again fix k equals to minus n and minus one. Then uh, the then the uh, uh, comparison theory says the following thing. Now remember, um, inside this um, inside this uh, uh, coordinate system, um, the x one equals to constant hyperplanes are um, intrinsically Euclidean, right? So then if you take any um, Euclidean polyhedron of one dimension lower, you can isometrically embed this polyhedron, say P1, into this X1 equals to constant fine hypersurface, right? Okay, so then we can take um, um, such a P1 and uh, take zero one cross P1. So then uh, we call such a thing a parabolic prism. So the statement is the following thing. So let me draw a parabolic prism. Okay, so um, this, once again, let's only do it to dimension two. So uh, let's say P1 is an interval. And then, um, uh, sorry, we're looking at uh, P1, uh, zero one cross P1. So. And this is a zero to one. Okay, take such a polyhedron, and um, um, suppose a um, MG is a Riemannian polyhedron, which admit once again the polyhedral diffeomorphism to P, and um, um, let's call this um, top surface here and the bottom surface here. Okay, so, all right. So remember that in the um, hyperbolic space, the top surface has mean curvature uh, uh, equal to the minus one. And uh, the bottom surface here has mean curvature um, minus and minus one uh, with respect to the outward point in you know, normal, right? And all these other surfaces has h equal to zero. Okay. So suppose uh, the scalar curvature is bounded from below by minus n times n minus one, and the mean curvature is bounded from below by the corresponding mean curvature on the modal surface, namely should be bounded from below by n minus one on the top surface, by minus n minus one on the bottom surface, and the non-negative on other faces, okay? And also let's assume that the dihedral angle of m is uh, less than or equal to the dihedral angle of p. Then the statement is that MG is isometric to a parabolic prism in HMGH, okay? So in a way, the dihedral rigidity uh, conjecture also applies to these uh, so-called parabolic prisms. And also like before, the statement holds for M, which admits degree one polyhedral map to P, not necessarily diffeomorphic to P. Okay, so before running uh, into the proof of the two statement, two theorems, uh, by the way, let's call this theorem the theorem B. Okay. So theorem A is for um, scalar non-negative, theorem B is for scalar bounded from below. Okay, so we will quickly see that both theorem A and the theorem B have deep connections with the so-called mass and quasi-local mass in uh, Riemannian general relativity. So 
A statement is the following. So assume theorem A holds for a single polyhedron P. Then one can prove the positive math theorem for syntactically flat manifolds in this uh, corresponding dimension. Okay, so let me uh, uh, give you a proof here. Okay, so um, suppose, um, suppose um, say X, M, and G is uh, syntactically flat. And let's suppose the contrary that um, the mass is uh, negative. Okay. So then what we do is that well, we first uh, use a observation by a Shen Yao in 79 and another ob observation by Locum. Okay, Locum. Well, if mass is negative, then these observations altogether means that we can deform the metric um, G such that, um, let's say the deformed metric is G cubed, okay? Such that the deformed metric has um, non-negative scalar curvature. And moreover, the metric G cubed is isometric to Euclidean outside the compact set. Okay, so let's draw the pictures here. So you know in the in, inside, um, You know, anything can happen, but outside it's just Euclidean. Okay. Now let's uh, play around with a polyhedron. So we know the polyhedron comparison works for P. Then what we can do is that we can rescale P um, by a very large factor such that the boundary of P actually isometric embeds into this uh, complement uh, of the um, compact set. So isometrically embed. Uh, P into, sorry, the boundary of P into X minus K. Can, uh, can isometric embed into it. But now this boundary um, bounds a region. So this, uh, so this boundary P in, in X bounds a region M, but then observe that M actually admits a polyhedral map of degree one onto P. So if I, So how do we do that? Well, we just uh, map K, the compact set K to a single point, and uh, we map um, M minus K to um, P minus the point. Okay, so this is a degree one polyhedral map. But on the other hand, um, this, this M satisfies all the three assumptions, namely scalar curvature non-negative, Boundary is isometric, so boundary um, is are minimal, and the hydro angles are everywhere equal. Therefore, by the uh, comparison theorem, by theorem A, we know that M is MG cubed is um, um, isometric to Euclidean domain. Okay, so this means that in the interior is just a flat, which is of course a contradiction. And likewise, the theorem B, remember in theorem B, the comparison model is a polyhedron in hyperbolic spaces. The theorem B implies the positive math theorem for asymptotically hyperbolic manifolds. Okay. I will uh, skip the details here. Okay, so both theorems are related with the positive math theorem. And uh, there are localizations of the theorems, as we can see. Um, so let's compare it with other um, localizations of the positive math theorems. So the following theorem is a very famous one due to Shi and Tam in 2002. They say the following thing, suppose you have a smooth Ramanian manifold with boundary and the boundary can be isometrically embedded into Rn as a boundary of convex domain, say omega zero, G zero. Then suppose that um, the mean curvature is positive and scalar curvature positive, then um, 
if you integrate the total mean curvature on the isometric embedding in the Euclidean space, subtract the total mean curvature on, with respect to the original metric, the difference is always non-negative. Okay. And moreover, we, we have the equality case, namely equality happens only when omega g is isometric to a, to a domain in Euclidean space. So the difference uh, of this boundary total mean curvature is called the brown york quasi local maps. Okay, so um, one thing we, we can learn from the theorem is that for a given domain, if you want to increase the interior scalar curvature, the price you need to pay is that the boundary mean curvature should decrease. Okay, this is, uh, this is the philosophy of such a theorem. And our dihedorigidic conjecture fits well with this um, um, observation. So let's, uh, let's have a look. Well, um, if you have a Ramanian polyhedron, say this is part of Ramanian polyhedron, then of course um, we, we can measure the mean curvature on the smooth part of the, of the face. Right? However, if you uh, view this polyhedron as a variable and you calculate its total first mean curvature, then apart, aside from this uh, mean curvature from the smooth part, its dihedral angles also contribute. Or precisely, if you um, integrate the, um, well, the dihedral angle along an edge, it's a delta distribution with, uh, uh, with width precisely pi minus alpha j. All right. And moreover, the, um, the, the lower dimensional singular strata, like in this picture, this, uh, um, these uh, vertices, they do not contribute to the total boundary mean curvature. OK. so. Then, um, um, if you increase the interior scalar curvature, um, presumably this uh, total first variation would decrease. That means the boundary mean curvature is going to decrease, and the the dihedral angle is going to increase. Okay, so motivated by this, can we detect mass or use the polyhedral domains to? Um, characterize the mass of a uh, symptotically flat or hyperbolic space? Well, um, the question is, is very interesting, I guess. And uh, it's, uh, it's been answered by a recent paper of Penzi Mill in three dimensions with cubes. So precisely what he can show is that, suppose you have a, a three-dimensional symptotically flat Ramanian manifold. And uh, um, you, you just consider the very, very large coordinate cube um, bounded by um, um, xj less than to l, okay, bigger to minus l less than to l. Then um, the mass is going to be approximately the up to a constant the, the total mean curvature on the bound, uh, on the faces and the dihedral angle difference with two pi over two on the edges. Okay. Um, of course, there's a lower order term, but this is basically it. Okay, so this basically wraps up uh, with uh, uh, for my introduction, um, and uh, we will move on to the proof of these uh, statements. So we're going to take a variational approach to both theorem A and theorem B. Okay, so uh, uh, recall that theorem A says that uh, the dihedral rigidity conjecture holds for all three-dimensional simplices and uh, general non-obtuse prisms. So I will illustrate this idea with three-dimensional simplex. OK, so the idea is, uh, is the following. So um, we're going to first take an arbitrary three-dimensional simplex and put a Ramanian metric on it. Okay, so this is going to be on M and G. Okay, and we assume um, scalar curvature of G is non-negative and uh, faces uh, weakly mean convex, and the dihedral angle um, of G is less than to the dihedral angle with respect to the uh, uh, Euclidean metric G is zero. Okay. So the first uh, reduction we're going to make uh, is that by this uh, so-called bending construction of Gromov, we can, without loss of generality, assume that this inequality sign here 
it's actually equality. Okay, so we can increase the dihedral angle while also increase the boundary mean curvature. Okay, it's not a difficult thing to do. So the picture we have in mind is the following, um, where we have this um, Hermannian polyhedron. This is, of, once again, mg. And uh, this is p of g0. And uh, um, um, our, we, we assume that the dihedral angles everywhere is equal to that dihedral angle. So in the picture here, this is also gamma g. Okay. So um, we're going to fix some notations. We're going to fix a vertex p um, on this uh, on m, and b is the opposite face. And uh, um, fj's are the faces, are the other three faces of the simplex, and the gamma j are the dihedral angles between fj and b. Okay. By assumption, they are just constant, equal to the dihedral angle, constant dihedral angle of p0, pg0. So what we're going to do is that we're taking the following um, uh, very, uh, functional. Okay, so um, you know we're uh, functional. We're gonna so okay. So in uh, in the functional, um, imagine that you have a separating surface sigma, separating the vertex p from the opposite uh, face b. Okay. And this uh, sigma will um, um, cut a region out, um, the upper region. Let's call that omega. So omega is the upper region. OK, so omega itself is, uh, uh, looks like a simplex of a smaller size. So what we're going to do is that we will um, consider the functional f of omega as above. So in this functional, we are taking the area of sigma. So this is the area of sigma. And the subtract a weighted area of other boundary pieces. OK, so remember, fj's are the other faces of the polyhedron. Um, and the boundary of omega intersect them, each of them. right? And these gamma j's are coming from this angle here, gamma j. All right. Of course, this is uh, our, our polyhedron M is compact, so f of omega um, is always bounded. Right? Um, therefore, the infimum is achieved, and uh, let's take this infimum, infimum i, and uh, we denote sigma to be the separating surface. So sigma is really the surface we're interested in. This. So the o minimizer always exists, um, but then the regularity is uh, difficult in general of sequence uh, difficult in general. Okay. But now let's assume everything is regular and, and, and uh, we can do analysis on that. Then sigma has to be a, what we call a minimal surface meeting each of these boundary component fj at constant angle gamma j. Okay. Well, such a surface is uh, called a capillary surface and this is a mathematical model for um, liquid drop in, uh, in physics. OK, so let's go back to the uh, minimizer a little bit and then see what happens if we're dealing with a prism. So prism, remember, is a Cartesian product. OK, so let's draw a prism here. Then uh, what we're going to do is that we still consider this omega. So remember, omega is the region um, separated, uh, the upper region separated by a surface sigma. Omega is upper region. But now, remember, we assume that the dihedral angles are everywhere along the edges are equal to the Euclidean model. So here, the angle is uh, pi over 2 precisely. Therefore, all, all the gamma j's are pi over 2. Okay. So we're just looking at uh, the first term, the boundary omega inside the interior of, uh, of M. Here, um, omega should be a cache poly set contains the top phase and disjoint from the bottom phase. And we're just to minimize the area of the separating surface. Therefore, the minimizer should be a free boundary minimal surface. Free boundary means that the surface is going to meet a smooth part of the ambient boundary uh, autonomy. 
Okay, so we assume everything is regular. So let's say whether this is really the case. So the difficult part in this argument is the regularity theory. Okay, so first observation is that our uh, variational problem is a problem with barriers, right? So we, we require that the top, in, in the simplex setting, the top, uh, the vertex is uh, um, contained in the omega and the bottom face is separate, disjoint from omega. Um, likewise, in the prism case, we said the top phase is contained omega and the bottom phase is destroying from omega. But um, so a priori, this problem is with uh, um, barriers. However, we assume that the boundary of M is weakly mean convex and the dihedral angles are, are precisely pi over 2 or precisely lesser to the uh, corresponding correct dihedral angle. Therefore, the observation is that the strong maximum principle holds for this uh, variational problem. Okay, so the proposition um, to sum up this uh, section is that um, the minimizer always exists and the separating surface um, always exists. Moreover, it either coincides with B or is totally disjoint from B. Okay, okay so namely, it cannot, the surface sigma cannot really touch on B in the interior or on the boundary. Okay. It's, so such a maximum principle is based on previous works by um, Bruce Solomon and Brian White. And also um, in a free boundary case, uh, smooth free boundary case by Martin Lee and Xin Zhou. So analogous statement holds for free boundary variables in higher dimensional Riemannian polyhedron. So let's discuss the regularity of sigma. Okay. So uh, we, need a, we need to separate this, the, the discussion into several pieces. So um, in dimension three, whether the um, M is a simplex or a, um, or a prism, we always have the following statement, namely the closure of uh, sigma is a C1 alpha graph over its tangent plane everywhere. Okay. C1 alpha, if you think about it, is a regularity. Um, uh, is regular enough for us to apply uh, Gauss-Bonnet theory of sigma. Okay, so also let me put some remarks here. So away from the corners, sigma is actually synfinity locally. However, near a, a corner, C1 alpha is the best regularity you can hope for. And this result relies on previous works on, um, of um, Gene Taylor, Leon Simon, and Gary Lieberman on these circuitry surfaces. So in dimensions between three and seven, um, things are gonna be much more complicated. And uh, um, the theorem um, I proved is, uh, is, is a theorem uh, joined with uh, Nick Avalon. So we proved the following thing. In three dimension between three and seven, if M is n dimensional uh, non obtuse prism, and if you take the uh, surface sigma, so remember we're dealing with a prism like this. And uh, the surface sigma is a free boundary separating surface. Okay. Then the closure of sigma is a C2 alpha graph over its tangent plane everywhere. Okay. So the non obtuse condition is used to guarantee C2 alpha regularity. If we only assume convexity, then we would have C1 alpha, but um, C1 alpha is not quite um, ideal to work with. Okay, so this is a, a proof by combining a new epsilon regularity theorem for um, free boundary variables in locally convex domains and together with a classification of minimizing columns. It's a technical theory. Okay, so let me outline um, um, the argument for prisms and uh, the, uh, the one for simplexes will hold, would also follow along the same lines, basically. So suppose you have a counterexample to the statement, namely, let's recall that um, R of G is non-negative, H of G non-negative, and uh, the dihedral angles um, of G is always less strong to the dihedral angle G zero, the Euclidean one. 
then let's take two opposite faces. Okay, so we have a prism structure, so we can take two opposite faces and consider the um, um, variational problem. So let's say this is B1 and this is B2. Just a minimized area of among all the separating surfaces um, between the top and bottom face. Okay. Now, by the regularity theorem we proved before, sigma is a C2 alpha free boundary and error minimizing hypersurface. Well, the stability uh, inequality for area functional gives us the uh, normal inequality. And uh, we take f, the first uh, Jacobi eigen function. So, in particular, f is going to be positive. And not, the non obtuse assumption here, once again, tells us that f is a C2 alpha function. The main um, geometric idea is to apply the Shen Yao dimension descent. So the observation is that on the sigma surface, so on, on this uh, surface sigma, well, you observe that sigma is itself a polyhedron, Ramanian polyhedron of dimension one lower. Okay, um, let's take the induced metric G and the conformally change it to another metric G cubed according to this first Jacobi eigenfunction. Then this new surface, the surface equipped with the new conformal metric satisfies the three conditions. First of all, it's a scalar curvature is non-negative. And second, the mean curvature is non-negative. So they, these two follow directly from the calculation um, on the eigen, eigenfunctions. And third is that the dihedral angle along edges of sigma is everywhere equal to that of the standard prism, okay, Euclidean prism. And this is because you're only doing a conformal change, right? Conformal change changes do not change the angle between any vectors. Okay, so, well, this um, gives us a, uh, a dimension descent argument as follows, right? So we can, we can basically apply this variational problem um, in every dimension and, uh, you know, from M to Sigma and to uh, dimension, co-dimension two surface, etc., all the way down to dimension two. Okay, so and such that sigma j is a counterexample to the theorem in each dimension. Okay. So when j is two, as we have seen before, sigma two has to be flat by Gauss-Bonnet theory. Then let's uh, use uh, induction uh, inductive assumption when we can find one flat polyhedron slice sigma. Okay. So Recall the picture is that we have this B1 and B2. And we have one good slice sigma. Okay, sigma is intrinsically uh, uh, flat and everything. Now we want to prove that the whole M is flat. So our approach is motivated by a splitting theorem by uh, Carlotto, Chodos, and Eichmir. So the, roughly speaking, the idea is that by choosing a family of deformations carefully, so analogous, um, and the solve analogous problem, we can find a nearby but different free boundary error minimizing surface sigma prime. Okay. So um, um, the picture um, in the picture, um, let me quickly go through the argument. So I claim that there is um, um, a conformal change of metrics, um, GT, such that we can solve the analogous problem while well, GT is different from G only um, inside this small purple ball. Okay. And also we can guarantee that the new minimizer sigma t prime must um, pass through this uh, red ball. Okay. And in particular, it's, they're all gonna be destroyed from sigma. And then let t go to zero, uh, the sigma t prime must converge back to another free boundary error minimizing surface. Okay, so you can freely choose the purple ball and the red ball um, inside this picture. Therefore, you can repeat this argument many times and uh, um, the, uh, the result is that you get a dense collection of disjoint prisms of um, dimension n minus one. And each of them is gonna be flat. Okay, so this is enough to show that Mg itself is flat. <laughs> okay, so we have discussed uh, very, uh, you know, in a very uh, concise manner how to um, um, prove the 
theorem A for R bigger than or equal to zero. And the corresponding theorem um, proof for theorem B is not much harder. So I'll skip that for um, um, to save some time. And uh, um, you might wonder what happens if we have a scalar curvature positive lower bound, R bigger than K, K positive. And say K is uh, just N times N minus one. Well, to answer this question, if, um, let me, uh, let's remind ourselves that both theorem A and theorem B are related with the positive math theorem. Right? So because of this, we anticipate the case for uh, R bigger than K, K positive, um, it's very delicate. And the reason is the following. So uh, Randall Marcus Nevis in their um, famous paper, um, Gave a counterexample to the mean O rigidity conjecture on the hemisphere. So namely, you can deform a metric on the hemisphere, making so. Uh, namely, let me be more specific. You can deform a metric on the hemisphere S n plus, such that R of G is uh, bigger than to six, and uh, um, the boundary. Um, it's totally geodesic. And moreover, the boundary induced metric is wrong. It's isometric. Metric on S and minus one. Okay, so with, it, with this in mind, um, um, the rigidity statement for higher demand for scalar curvature bounding from below by a positive constant, it's going to be very tricky. Okay, so I, I guess this uh, six can be replaced by general in, in minus one. So for us, the, the, um, if such a comparison theorem holds, then I would guess that the um, comparison model is a standard spherical simplex. So omega n is, um, 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 the uh, portion of the work tent inside the sphere. Then um, maybe the rigidity holds. So the conjecture is, suppose you have a Riemannian simplex such that R of G is um, at least N times N minus one on it. And the phases are piecewise totally, ge totally geodesic, let's say. And the dihedral angle of M is everywhere non-obtuse, okay? And moreover, the phases of M are piecewise isometric to the sphere, standard spherical simplex of dimension n minus one. <clears throat> so contractually, this Mg would be isometric to the standard spherical complex omega n. And uh, let me um, <clears throat> um, finish here by introducing this uh, conjecture of whether the dihedral angle um, um, conjecture holds for positive scalar curvature lower bound. Um, it may be true, it may be false. Uh, the only thing I can say is that the Brando Marcus Nevis counterexample um, does not directly apply here. Okay. So thank you for, uh, thank you to all, uh, all of you who watched this uh, talk. And uh, I want to thank again to the organizers of this virtual workshop. And uh, it's been an honor to give a talk in, uh, in this uh, workshop.